Hello, Life Point friends and family. Thank you for joining us today. If you're new, welcome to the family. May God's message find its way to you no matter where you are. Enjoy the service.
Seasons of winter And you'd get anything To feel the sun Always reaching Always calling Always second guessing the time But God has a plan A purpose in this You are a child So don't you forget He put that hunger in your heart He put that fire in your soul 
together with you today to get a little closer to you and I pray that you bring peace and love and compassion to us all to this world to those who are hurting I ask that you bring healing those who are ill I pray that you place your healing hand over them thank you for the blessing of your love and your forgiveness God it is truly a treasure to be a child of yours and to be loved by you. May you bring us all closer to you each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, LifePoint family. We're so happy that you're here with us today. And if this is your first time joining, we would love to welcome you and get to know you. So if you could please text hello to the number on the screen. You can also text your prayer requests to the number on the screen and we will add you to the prayer request list. We are here to be with you as a family and welcome you in as one of our own.
Welcome to 2022. What a surprise. I think a year ago when we went into 2021, we were thinking, well, okay, this is a, you can't believe this thing has lasted a year, but now we're in uh, two years and we're, well, it's still going on. It's kind of a surprise, isn't it? But here's the thing. We've gotten this far and we'll get the rest of the way. Together, we're going to find ways to adapt and make something good out of the difficulties that we face in life. In fact, God's going to use these kinds of moments for good in our life to help us to grow, to help us to get stronger, to help us find ways to, well, to help other people as they're struggling, as they're going through whatever they experience in life. The end result of all this is is we'll be better people, we'll be stronger people. We can pull together even more than we have in the past. I don't want to be the same at the end of 2022 that I am right now. I, we don't have to stay the way we are. We, 2022 can't dictate to us how we're going to be. We can make choices. In fact, we're going to make choices, and today we'll even make choices. One of the main choices that we need to make is an area that's been impacted very, well, very harshly in the last couple of years, and that's our relationships. The last couple of years, as a, as a matter of, well, just being cautious and careful and prudent, we have, on purpose, kind of limited our interactions with other people. And I can understand that. And so what we need to do, even in the middle of a pandemic, is find safe ways to, to actually foster relationships, which we can do. Because relationships are the things that, well, that help you succeed in life, that add value to your life that, well, that just, it's just what makes life so ever love and sweet. I mean, it's the, the older I get, the more I just simply value the, you know, friends and family and the relationships I've had over the years. And I think it's the true for you as well. The Bible is huge on relationships. I mean, when you stop and think about it, what was God all about in the whole thing? The whole Bible is a basically an effort for God to bring us into a relationship with him through the forgiveness he offers through Jesus Christ. So God wants a relationship with us, and he wants to help us with our relationships. The Bible is just full of examples like that. I could just pull a few ones that are common that, well, if you've been around church very long, you've heard it. For example, in Proverbs, it says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And then we read, In Hebrews, and and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, which is what we're doing right now. How can we spur one another on toward love and good deeds? And then in the book that's hard to spell, Ecclesiastes. I don't know why, but I I always have to concentrate when I spell that book. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, we read, two are better than one. And the older I get, the more I, I, I see that because they have a good return on their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. This last couple of years, the thing that has been the hardest on people, I guess it's probably hardest on children and the older adults more than any other group, but hard on all of us, is the fact that we have been socially isolating more than we would normally do. You can take the meanest guy you know, the toughest guy in the whole world, and what do you do to him if you want to make things tough on him? Well, you put him in solitary confinement because even the toughest guy in the whole world needs people, needs relationships. We need relationships. Now, the Bible says that we need three kinds of different relationships. We don't, there's three different kinds of relationships that we have to choose, and we have to choose to develop them. And we can see each of these things illustrated in many different places in the Bible, but one of the really simple places to kind of illustrate what the Bible has in mind for the plan for relationships that God has for us is in the life of a guy named Moses. Now, Moses, he's one of the most famous guys in the whole Bible. I mean, even if you've never read a one word in the Bible, you've probably heard of Moses, the guy that, well, that delivered the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt. God used this guy in a huge way. I mean, he went before Pharaoh. At that point, that was the most powerful nation in the world. 
So he had to go before the most powerful man in the most powerful nation and say, I want you to let all my people go. And the guy could have killed him. I mean, it was a very dangerous thing to do. It was a very threatening thing to do. But that's what God asked him to do. And then God did these supernatural things through him to make the Pharaoh let all those Israelites leave. And so he experienced all these incredible experiences of coming up to a body of water of the Red Sea and God parted it so they could go through it and then brought them out into a wilderness area and provided water and food for them, brought them to Mount Sinai and gave them the Ten Commandments. This guy, he had experiences that, well, just warped the imagination, what it would be like to be, to be Moses. But guess what? <laughs> you say, you know, that, that would be an awesome experience to have all that. Well, you know what else it would be? A whole boatload of stress. Can you imagine the, okay, you're the guy that God says, you want me to do what? You want me to go before Pharaoh and say, let all my people go? And then in tremendous stress. And then to lead all these people out. And you know how it is when you're trying to lead a bunch of people. It's like herding cats. They, some want to go one way, some want to go another. People complain about anything. I mean, it, the truth of the matter is I could give away ice cream and, so, and somebody would complain, right, that it wasn't yogurt. So you can imagine what it would be like trying to take all these people and move them in mass together. And, and when they experienced problems, man, he had all kinds of just unbelievable stress that he had to deal with. And he didn't always do well with it. Sometimes he got to him, just like he gets to us. But God had a plan, the same plan for him that he has for us. He saw that Moses needed some help, so he sent people to help him. And the first type of person that God sent to help him was a, was a mentor. So here's Moses with all these people and all their problems. And Moses' father-in-law shows up with his wife, with Moses' wife and his, his kids. Because when Moses left to go to Pharaoh to say, let all these people go, he didn't take his wife and kids with him. So now he's moved all these people out of Egypt. They're out in this area called the, well, what we call the Sinai Peninsula, what they call the wilderness in the Bible. And he's got all these huge problems. So his father-in-law shows up with his wife and his two kids. And here's what happened. In Exodus chapter 18, here's what we read. Moses' father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, heard about everything that God had done for Moses and his people, the Israelites. I mean, yeah, no kidding. When the most powerful nation on the whole face of the earth lets go a whole bunch of people after a whole bunch of miracles, everybody's talking about it. I mean, this is the kind of thing that spreads like wildfire. He heard especially about how the Lord had rescued them from Egypt. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, now came to visit Moses in the wilderness. He brought Moses' wife and his two sons, and they arrived with Moses, and the people were camped near the mountain of God, Mount, Mount Sinai, where he got the Ten Commandments. The next day, Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other. Just like always, people have problems. He was trying to help. They waited before him from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he asked, what are you re really accomplishing here, Moses? Why are you trying to do all this alone while everyone stands around you from morning till evening? Moses is just doing the best he could. And he said, well, because the people come to me to get a ruling from God. When a dispute arises, they come to me and I'm the one who saddles the case between the quarreling parties. I inform the people of God's decrees and give them his instructions. So here's Moses. He's doing the best he can. He's doing what he thinks is right. He's, he's working hard. He's not lazy. He's busting it from dawn to dusk, trying to you know, keep things you know, working well, trying to keep the peace between all the people. He's, he's struggling. I mean, he's, he's, well, he's, he's going under. He's getting frustrated. They're, the people are frustrated. It's just not working, but he's doing the best he can. He's got a great attitude. I mean, he's, he's really working hard, but it's just not 
working. And Moses has a mentor that shows up and helps him out. So Moses gets mentored. And here's what happened. This is not good, Moses father in law exclaimed. You're going to wear yourself out, and the people too. This job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Now listen to me. Let me give you a word of advice. And may God be with you. You should continue to be the people's representative before God, bringing their disputes to him. But teach them God's decrees and give them his instructions. Show them how to conduct their lives. But select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and bribes, hate bribes, and appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,000, if they're capable of leading 1,000, over 100, if they're capable of leading 100, over 50, if that's what their capacity is in your judgment, and over 10. They should always be available to solve the people's common disputes, but, but have them bring the major cases to you. Let the leaders decide the smaller matters themselves. They will help you carry the load, making the task easier for you. If you follow this advice, and if God commands you to do so, then you'll be able to endure the pressures, and all these people will go home in peace. Everybody will benefit. So here's Jethro. <laughs> Where does he get all this? Why is Jethro able to do this? Well, it's because he's older, he has more wisdom, he has more knowledge, he has more experience. He's a few steps ahead of where Moses is. He has a mentor that speaks into his life, that accelerates his progress, that makes a life-changing difference in just a matter of minutes by the, by the wisdom that he got in that moment. So the question is this. Do you have a mentor in your life? And here's the surprise twist on this. Do you have mentors in your life? Because one of the things I'm going to try to emphasize this morning is that you don't need a mentor, you need mentors for the different areas of your life. Let's say, for example, you're a, a young married woman and you have children. What relationship do you have with an older woman who's had children? They can help you with those difficult things that come up, help you have some, some wisdom about what to do. You're married, you're a guy, and you're trying to figure out the whole marriage thing and work balance, life balance, all this kind of thing. Well, who is the person that you go to that's ahead of you that's done well there that can give you advice? You're in a company. You're doing some type of work in some field. You've got, it doesn't matter whether you're a teacher or a banker or doesn't matter. Electrician, doesn't matter. Who do you go to for advice? What mentor do you have? The point I'm trying to make is this. In every area of your life, you, if you're wise, you'll seek advice from those who have more experience and knowledge and wisdom than you do. This last week I was reading that 71% of the Fortune 500 companies have mentoring programs in their company. And 80%, 80% of the Fortune 500 CEOs have mentors, not singular, plural. Learn from the wise. Make a decision that, you know what, I'm going to head that direction. But you also need something else, and we see it, we see it in Moses' life as well. You need teammates. You need people that not only are ahead of you, but you need people that are beside you that are kind of working going through life together with you. A mentor is not somebody you're going to hang out with and talk to necessarily every day. It's going to be as, as occasions come up, as you have questions, as you have problems, you go to them, you talk about things. But you have these teammates, these people that you're going through life with. And we can see that, that Moses' need for the very same thing. He struggled when God said, hey, I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I want you to tell him, let my people go. And God says, I'll tell you what to say. Well, he, Moses did something we've done. Well, I shouldn't say we. Maybe you haven't. But a lot of us have. 
When I, we have this prompting that God wants us to do something. We have this thought that comes to our mind. We're in a, we're in a worship service like now. And this thought comes to me that I, you know, I should do this particular task. And then all of a sudden, no, wait a minute now. But then we start coming up with all the reasons that we can't do it, we shouldn't do it, we're not qualified, I wouldn't be good at it. I, if I did that, I'd be embarrassed because I couldn't do a good job. I mean, we start, no, well, well I think you, I, hey God, I don't think I'm the right guy. I'm not the right gal. Moses says, I'm not the right guy. He says, God, I can't talk. I mean, I, I, I get all tongue twat, all that kind of stuff, I just, I'm not good at speaking, God. I just don't think I'm the guy for the job. What did God do? But Moses pleaded with the Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. I've never been. And I'm not, I'm not now. Even though you've spoken to me. In other words, I've got, this is like, I mean, yeah, this is, yeah, this is just as weird as you think it is. This is the God of the universe it's literally speaking to a human being. How many times that happened? Almost never, but it did with him. And in spite of that, he says, I get tongue tied and my words get tangled. And then the Lord became angry. <laughs> hey, look, oh man, okay. If God shows up, starts talking to you and says, I want you to do something, uh, it's almost like an IQ test. I mean, if, you know, okay. How's, how, don't you think I'm going to help you do it? Well, he, he's, he's, he doesn't see that. All he sees is all the reasons he shouldn't be doing it. And God says, okay, okay, Moses, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he speaks well. And look, he's on his way to meet you now, and he will be delighted to see you. Talk to him and put the words in his mouth that I've given you. And I will be, I will be with both of you as you speak, and I will instruct you both in what to do. Aaron will be your spokesman. To the people. He will be your mouthpiece and you'll, you will stand in the place of God for him. In other words, I'm, I'm going to show you what to do. I'm going to show you what to say. And you're going to say, this is what God wants you to do. Telling him exactly what to say. Now, that should take away all your anxieties if you, if you reach a point like that, right? So what God did is put together a team what you want in terms of a teammates is you, you want people that kind of compliment you. You don't want everybody to look like you, to have the same strengths and weaknesses that you do. You'd like to have your teammates be good at what you're not good at. Let's say, I mean, for, this is a football season, right? If everybody on the team was identical, you'd be in trouble. You need different people with different skill sets, right? So when you put together a team, football team, life team, whatever kind of team, you want to, you'd like to have people on the team that compliment you, that are good where you're weak. In fact, even in my marriage, it kind of works out that way. My wife is good in some areas that I'm not, and I'm good in other areas that she's not. And that works out well. We need that in terms of our, our, our life, as we're going through life, we, we need a, a team of people that are pulling through, whether we're in a church, in a work setting, school setting, it doesn't matter. Who's your team? So what God says is this, in terms of relationships, you need mentors. You need to think in terms of the team you're going through your life with. And you need to develop both of those. But there's a third type of person that God says you need in your life, and that's a supporter. Here's, here's the setting. Moses led all these people out into what they call the wilderness, what we'd call the Sinai Peninsula. Then they were attacked by this large, this country, Amalekites, and they were in trouble. Moses already knew that if it, went, if it was just his people against their people, they're going to lose. He knew that. He, so he knew he's in trouble. And so he knew that if God didn't show up, it's all over. So he did what he knows. What did he know at that particular point? He knew that God had given him, and if you read in the text, you'll, you'll find it's very fascinating. God gave him this shepherd's staff. And with that staff, God would do certain things. When, it, when he needed to part the, the Red Sea, he, he was instructed to 
put the staff into the water and the water parted. So he came to realize that that was a symbol of, of God acting, not him. It wasn't his power. It wasn't him doing it. It was God doing it. So he came up with this plan that he was going to make it obvious to one and all that we're going to depend on God to give the victory. We're going to do the best we can, but we're going to depend on God to show up. Let me read the passage to you in Exodus. It says, while the people of Israel were still at Rephidim, the warriors of Amalek attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, choose some of the men to go out and fight the army of Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill holding the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of, of a nearby hill. And as long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amaleks gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on, and then they stood on each side of Moses holding up his hands. So his hands held steady until sunset. And as a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in battle. Now, at first reading, that should strike you as strange. But here's what God was trying to do. God put this in the Bible for a very specific reason. And the very specific reason is this. He wants us to realize that what we're going to have a tendency to do is to try to do everything that we're facing in life without God. But when we get in trouble, when we, oh, God, I can't, I can't handle this. I need you to show up. It's like, okay, if I can't handle it, then I'll pray and I'll ask God to help. That's what we have a tendency to do as human beings. And so what God wanted to do is to illustrate that it wasn't simply hold up the staff, I'll take care of everything. They still had to go down and fight the battle, didn't they? So it was their effort in a dependence on God. Guess what it is when every time God asks you to do something, it's your effort with a dependence on God showing up. And so what God wanted to do was to give us this visual illustration of the fact that as we go through life, if we go through life with a dependence on God showing up, saying, you know what, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I just know I'm supposed to do this. And if God doesn't show up, it's not going to work. But I'm going to do the best I can and just depend on God to show up. And that's what they did. So God, so to this point forward, anytime you're having an argument at home with your wife and you're thinking, I need to win, I need God's help, just hold your arms up, right? No, of course not. That's ridiculous. That's not the point. The point is, as you go through life, with a dependence upon God to show up and to help you with the problems that you're facing in life. The full expectation, I'm going to do everything I can, and I'm going to depend on God to do the rest. Because I think I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to follow him wherever he, he's, he's leading me to go. I want to go there. And God, I want to do what you want me to do. But here's what I know. I know I'm going to make a mess of things if without your help. I know that you're leading me to do something bigger than me. For example... Whenever you get this prompting or, you know, you're thinking, I should do something. I should, at work, I should take on this task. I really think I'm supposed to do it, but you're afraid. Or at church, you think, uh, you know, life group, yeah, I should join one. I even thought about, you know, the, the pastor said, maybe I should consider even starting one. Oh, my gosh, that's ridiculous. I couldn't possibly do that. Yeah, you're right. If you don't depend on God to show up, exactly. But if you depend on God to show up, guess what happens? If God will lead you into it, and then it'll help you do it. To have the courage to do what's in front of you. And yes, he'll lead you to the point where it takes courage. Courage is, in, is you know, you're not going to have a point where you don't have any fear or nervousness. It just, you just act. You say, you know what? I think I'm supposed to do this. I'm going to do it. If I fail, I fail. It's kind of like Esther said, if I perish, I perish. I'm just going to do what God wants me to do, whatever it is. I'll leave the outcome to him. I just want to follow him wherever he wants me to go. So here's the question. Who's holding you up? Where are your encouragers? Where are the people that come in for you when you're in trouble that hold your arms up? 
when you're discouraged, when you're overwhelmed, when you need that help, do you have those kind of people that step forward into your life? No, I do. I've got all three. And it's, what, it's the reason I'm here. Because people, I have, because I had mentors my entire life, plural, not one, plural. Because I need help in different areas for different things. I need teammates. Guess what? That's you. I need people to help me go through life together because I'm a pastor. And those of you that know me, well, those of you that don't, get ready to be real disappointed. I'm not good at everything. In fact, I'm lousy at some things. But I got people around here that are good in areas where I'm lousy. And so we work together. Nobody brings everything to the table. And that's okay. God fixed it, so we need each other. And that's exactly what he intends. Whatever gifts and abilities and strengths that you have are perfectly designed for what we need here. We need you. God sent you. He has a job for you. And he's going to show up when you do begin to do what God wants you to do. It's just wonderful to follow God's plan. So, so here's a couple, three questions, and the answer is yes or no. Just yes or no. Here we go. First question. Do you have mentors in your life? Maybe I'll make it simpler. Do you have a, a mentor? The answer is yes or the answer is no. Do you have a team around you with people that compliment you that, you know, they're, they're strong where you're weak and you're strong where they're weak? Do you have a, a team of people that you're going through life together with? Answer is yes, or the answer is no. Do you have these, these encouragers, the people that, that know you well enough that when they say, oh my gosh, Alan's having a hard time, I better do something to encourage him, to help him. You know, even this week I had people, I guess they could tell, I'm, because of the pandemic, it's harder to get volunteers. And, and so I had and some people picked up on that. And I've had people this week say, look, I'll work every week until more volunteers come. Supporters. They can tell I'm in a little bit of trouble because of the pandemic. That's okay. We're in trouble. We'll find a way through it. Not to worry. <laughs> Do we have problems? You bet. Will we have problems after the pandemic's over? Yeah, we'll have the problems there too. And so together, we, we, our team pulls together and supporters show up when, when things get really tough. And it makes, makes a difference. You need all three. Now, how do you get them? You say, I'd like to have them. I, I don't know. Okay, how do you get them? Now, one of the most important things I'm going to say all morning is what I'm about to say. Dramatic pause. So you'll pay attention. You don't find them, you make them. What does that mean? As I was going through my life, I've moved a bunch of times, a lot, a whole lot. And I've noticed as I've moved to new places that if I wanted friends, that I needed to go spend time with people. In other words, I'll make up something. If I see like 10 people I'd like to have the potential to make a friendship with, and I reach out to those 10 people, three or four of them are not going to respond at all because they're already so busy. they got so much going on. they already got more friends than they can keep up with whatever. And then I do something with the other six because the way you have friends is you do things with people. And out of those six people, maybe two of them will continue to do things with and over a period of time will develop a friendship. I've also seen the opposite for what people do. I've watched, as I've been new and I walked into an environment, I've seen other new people walk into an environment and what they would do is just sit there and wait for people to come be their friend. It doesn't work. The way you develop friends, the way you get supporters, the way you have mentors is you make them. You go find them. And it doesn't, it's not a always smooth process, but you get there. It's not that difficult. 
but you just simply have to keep going until you've made them. They don't come find you normally. You go find them. You make them. The other thing I've noticed in life is this. Sometimes people are hesitant when someone even reaches out to help them. They don't welcome someone into their life. Because, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to admit I don't know something and need advice. I don't want to admit that I'm weak in certain areas. I need to have people to make up for my weakness. That would be illustrated in an environment where you're the boss and you're hiring people and you're afraid to hire anybody that's as good as you or better because of your insecurity and you don't want to address the fact that I need to find somebody really sharp that's area of my weakness. Our pride gets in our way sometimes. It's a humble person that says, you know, I, I welcome mentors. I welcome friends that have strengths that I don't have. I welcome supporters. I, I have weaknesses. I, I, I know I need the help. Moses welcomed the help. He did exactly what his father-in-law asked him to do. He went out and appointed people to lead hunt, thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. He did it. He welcomed it. He was humble enough. In fact, the Bible says that, that Moses really was a humble man. He had to get humbled toward the end. At first, he didn't start out that way. Only age and wisdom got him there, but he got there. So a couple of keys here. One of the keys to developing mentors in your life is to, to simply say this. There are things I don't know that I need to know. I need to find someone that knows this. You have to be humble enough to say, I don't know. And find people that do know. That's a key to finding a mentor. A key to building a team is to is to say, you know, uh, I can't do this all myself. I, I, I need help. I need other people to help me with my, what I'm trying to do in life. So you have to be able to say, I can't do everything. So to be, for a mentor, you have to say, I don't know. <laughs> for a teammate, you have to say, I can't do everything. And for a supporter, you have to say, you know what? The truth is, is I'm not bulletproof. I have weaknesses. And when you get there, it'll be a good moment. So I have four things I want to end with. And the first one is this. Develop relationships with people who are one or two steps ahead of you in every area of your life. Marriage, kids, work. Spiritually. That's why you should be, for one thing, you should be in a life group or start one. Because there'll be some people that'll be ahead of you. Number two is cultivate a few great friends with whom you can be 100% honest. You can't do that with everybody, but you can do it with somebody. Find those people. That's another reason you should be in a life group. Because let's say there's 10 people in a life group. You're not going to do it with all 10 necessarily, but there might be one or two in that group that, that knows pretty much everything about you. And third, spend meaningful time with people that give you energy. You know, encouragers. Does you good, doesn't it? If you hang around people like that, it'll help you in those moments. People that know you and know you need encouragement and are ready to step in. I need them, you need them, we all need them. And finally, start a, well, get yourself a rock solid devotional routine where every day at a certain, whether it's one minute or 30 minutes or whatever it is, just you've got this rock solid thing where you're spending time reading the Bible and praying. When you do these kinds of things, your life will be, well, you, oh my gosh, it's like, it's like life on steroids. I mean, you're just going and going and going and finding joy. You're going through life. You have 
you're having, you got mentors that are helping you in the different areas of your life. You got these teammates that are going through life with you. They compliment you, you compliment them. And you got those encouragers that rush in when you need it because sometimes life can just simply beat you up. But it also goes the other way too. You need to be a mentor to somebody. You say, I don't know enough to be a mentor. Yeah, you do. If, even if you're in high school, you can be a mentor to a middle school kid. You know something. There's somebody that you can help. And you can be somebody else's teammate. You can be somebody else's encourager. And together, this next year, we don't have to be the same, do we? We can choose to be different. What I'd like for you to do is to make the decision right now, not later, because you've heard people talk about this before. Did it change when you heard someone talk about it before? Decide. Yes, I'm going to develop mentors. Yes, I'm going to seek teammates because I can't do everything. And yes, I'm going to open up my life and be honest that I need supporters. I need encouragers. And I'm also going to be all three to other people. God, I just thank you for the fact that you're at work in our life, that you, that you love us and you have a plan for us. You have a plan for our relationships. You want us to have all three of these types of relationships and be all three to other people. So I just pray that you do this tremendous work in our lives and help us as we go through these days and weeks and months ahead of this year, that we would not be the same, that we would choose to do differently, that we would follow your plan for our relationships. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear. the different struggles that we have each day of our life. We're confronted with the fact that we struggle to do the right thing. But the God of this universe loves us so much that He came to, to offer forgiveness for us. A God that loves us but is a just God. A just God that wants there to be a reckoning for sin, that for there to be justice in the world. So to satisfy that, he took the punishment for our sin. The night before he was crucified, he took bread and he said, I want you to do this every so often to remind you of the fact that my body was broken for you. At the moment, the disciples didn't understand. But after a period of time, 
they put two and two together. They realized later that he was talking about him being crucified the next day. How his body was broken. And so he said to do this in remembrance of what he did for us. So Lord, we do. We remember and we thank you. At the end of the supper together, there was a cup of wine there. And Jesus made this incredible statement. He said, that cup represents my blood, which will be poured out for you. And what he was saying was, is I'm going to, I'm going to literally die. I'm going to take the punishment for your sin so that you don't have to. And so he turns around and he offers forgiveness to us. He says, you can be forgiven because I'm taking the punishment. I mean, you can choose to reject this gift I'm giving you. Or you can accept this gift I, give, I offer to you by admitting that you sinned, by trusting me to forgive you and giving me leadership of your life. As the Bible says, to trust Jesus as your Savior and Lord. When you do that, you're forgiven. And Jesus said, I, ever so often, he says, as often as you do it, do this in remembrance of me. And so he's asked us every so often to eat the bread and drink the cup to remember that the God of this universe loved us so much that he came and died for us so that we could be forgiven. Lord Jesus, we remember, we're amazed <laughs> at your amazing grace, and we thank you. God, we just pray as we finish this song that you remind us afresh of your great love, your great forgiveness, your amazing grace. Slow.